My name is Catherine Sharkey. I'm a law professor at NYU and um, delighted to be here. Uh, I was actually at the symposium that uh, ULC organized two years ago. It seems uh, like it wasn't that long ago because many of the same issues are still uh, on my mind. Um, what's interesting to me or intriguing to see is obviously Dodd-Frank and the uh, regulation in financial services has uh, taken kind of a front seat with respect to being emblematic of some issues about um, federalism, about preemption, uh, and the like. I think it actually works quite nicely that our panels are overlapping, the first and second panel um, in particular, and I'm going to um, introduce uh, the panelists uh, to my uh, left is Rick Hills, who's uh, a colleague at NYU and also a um, close friend, it turns out, of mine as well. And then to his left, uh, Professor uh, Arthur Wilmarth of uh, George Washington University. And each of them is going to um, speak for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then I'm going to uh, do my uh, um, uh, pitch after that. But one thing I just um, wanted to remark on is it's interesting. John Ryan alluded in the first panel to the long history of federal interest in banking, and that's going to be uh, the topic of Rick's opening remarks, at least. He's done some really impressive work uh, looking into the history of um, nationalism and federalism in banking, and then he's going to bring us up to the um, current controversy. Professor Wilmarth um, is a leading expert on Dodd-Frank, um, and in particular um, is sort of the um, the leading authority on those select but very important uh, pages that were alluded to uh, by um, Andrew Ullman on the preemption provisions, Title, te title 10 of Don Frank. So those will be the topic uh, of his remarks. And then I'll come back um, and we'll speak. What we'll try to do in our panel, I think, is cover those two topics, but then broaden out from that. Use uh, OCC and Dodd-Frank and preemption uh, as a kind of springboard for thinking more generally about preemption, about the role of congressional, of Congress, uh, the executive and federal agencies, and in particular the state interest and how they can uh, intervene in those uh, different institutional uh, frameworks. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, and the reason actually I alluded to Rick being not only my colleague and friend, there is a sense now that I'm realizing that topics of federalism and preemption become a little bit of a, this is your life. Because not <laughs> only uh, do I get to uh, have colleagues and friends to discuss these issues, but as it turns out, uh, Tom Pirelli, who was the moderator of the previous panel, was a young associate at the very first uh, law firm I ever worked for in law school for one summer, so we've reunited. And Mike Skodro, who we're gonna hear from in a, few, in a further panel, was a close friend and classmate of mine in law school. So it's kind of nice to see that the, uh, these preeminent issues of the day can also unite such uh, important, analytically smart, but also very nice people to come to the table to uh, discuss. Maybe that will help in uh, theories of cooperative federalism <laughs> going forward. So Rick, over to you. So um, I was just looking through the panel quickly because I think we're the only pure professors panel. Is that right? It's a dangerous thing. It's right? a dangerous <laughs> thing, and um, you know, it's just it's it's a wonderful experience for me to pull my head out of the 19th century where I've been lost for the last two years writing a book about 19th century federalism, and I, I kind of blink my eyes and look out and see all these guys in like modern dress talking in microphones. <laughs> And in fact, talking about contemporary issues, what I want to do is be very professorial and talk a little bit about the background to banking law. Um, the reason why I hope this won't be quite as academic as this tweety sounding talk might sound is actually I believe the OCC is reviving absolutely 19th century theories. That the OCC and the guys I'm talking about modern harmonization and the need for competition is actually reviving hoary old federalist theories that I will argue, this is a pugnacious part, are rather thoroughly discredited. Um, but let me just make three points quickly. Um, I hope I can make them in you know seven or eight minutes. First of all, I want to explain this hoary old theory. It's called the federal instrumentality theory. It actually predates McCulloch, with which most of us associate it. Um, and I want to talk about you know its origins, the intellectual background behind it. Then I want to talk quickly about this hostile reaction to the federal instrumentality theory. I want to say it's been rejected quite thoroughly twice, first by Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party, then by Louis Brandeis's 
Democratic New Freedom Democratic Party. But 1832 and 1912 are the key dates. And these revolutions really overthrew the federal instrumentality theory, and the Supreme Court followed along. And third, I just want to explain why I think, for better or for worse, and this I don't want to be a normative point, the OCC is almost certainly trying to revive this theory, largely borrowing from the OTS, the Office of Thrift Supervision, that relies very heavily on McCulloch. So let me go through these three points quickly. What is the federal instrumentality theory? You all know from first year constitutional law, it somehow is related to McCulloch. The basic idea is that federally chartered corporations should be regarded as quasi-public expert federal agencies, sort of like the Securities and Exchange Commission. The idea is that although they're private corporations, they should largely be immune, not only from state control, but really from democratic control. They should be independent agencies. And it was a theory that was pushed not only by John Marshall, but by Robert Morris, our first commissioner of finance during the American Revolution, superintendent of finance, and by Alexander Hamilton. And the idea was that these people, largely Federalists with a capital F, that means they don't like federalism, remember that, these um, Federalists were very suspicious of democratic institutions, especially associated with finance. They regarded them as Jacobinical, that's what they would say, populist, or here's the word they constantly use, with a capital A, agrarian. And by agrarian, they meant later Jacksonian. These are guys with pitchforks in the state legislators, don't let them get their hands on our banks. And so they tried to create institutions that would largely be autonomous. Um, and the Bank of the United States was an example of this institution, but by no means not the only one. Alexander Hamilton founded something called the Society for Useful Manufacturers, a New Jersey corporation that was largely supposed to run like this. Here's how it works. The Bank of the United States, despite its name, is not run by the United States. Only five directors out of 20 are appointed by the president. And because of rules regarding the charter, the theory was that Congress could not actually repeal their charter. And so when Andrew Jackson refuses to renew the second Bank of the United States Charter, his complaint is not that national banks or national banking should be disuniform. His complaint is that this entity has been liberated from any democratic control. Roger Taney, his Secretary of Treasury, actually writes a report saying, the problem with this bank, as they called it, the monster bank, <laughs> is that it was free from any kind of even federal democratic oversight. And I want to emphasize this very much because the second point I want to make is the hostile reaction to the federal instrumentality theory was not rooted in some notion that national banking should be regulated by a crazy quilt or a patchwork of disuniform laws. Andrew Jackson was a strong nationalist, believe it or not. And his two Secretary of Treasuries, Roger Taney and Levy Woodbury, pushed uniform national regulation. The first uniform national regulation was the pet bank theory. Basically, Jackson said, you want federal deposits? You're going to play by federal rules. Roger Taney invented, it never was implemented, it was implemented by the, Jackson's Democratic successor, Van Buren, the independent treasury system. The basic idea is we're going to put federal deposits in federal institutions. So they were both big proponents of federal uniformity, but their basic point was simple. I'm going to state it in modern terms. They would have used more florid 19th century language. If a banking risk should not be subject to state regulation, if it needs uniform regulation, then a genuinely federal and public official ought to evaluate that specific risk and expressly bestow immunity from state regulation of that risk. It should not be the case that a private institution should make the call as to whether that risk should be regulated. That was their main complaint. Now, what happened to this Jacksonian theory? Well, it reigned triumphant from 1832 until the Civil War, for the simple reason that the Democratic Party controlled Congress and the presidency largely through the, throughout this period and the Supreme Court. And the way they made sure that federal corporations would never, ever be immune from state control is they refused to create federal corporations. There were no federal corporations created after the bank, Second Bank of the United States Charter expired before the Civil War outside of Washington, D.C. There was a strong presumption that there should be no federal corporations. And McCulloch, that case that we always read, the case that we know is a hoary foundation of constitutional law, was not cited once by the US Supreme Court in the firm hands of Jackson's Secretary of the Treasury, Roger Taney. It was buried. Now, what happened during the Civil War? All the Democrats were chased out of Congress, obviously, so the Republicans had their heyday. The first thing they did was charter, of course, the Union Pacific Railroad, Howard University, and the Red Cross. Those were the first federal corporations created after the Bank of the United States. The Feds were now, the, the Federalist theory, the Federal Instrumentality theory was now back in business. And they could do this because they ruled the roost for a brief period. 
The National Bank Act revives this theory. Not in its text. Congress is actually silent about the role of the states in regulating nationally chartered banks. But the US Supreme Court slowly adopts this theory in the following form. Following some hints in McCulloch v. Maryland, the US Supreme Court divides state regulations into two parts. One kind of state regulation is banking-specific regulation. It's any state regulation that specifically is addressed to deposit taking and lending. And the US Supreme Court says, not so many words, but basically, the state shouldn't be in the business of regulating in this way. If what they're doing is regulating a nationally chartered bank, and we're talking about nationally chartered banks, just keep that in the background, with a law that's specifically directed to banking, that should be pushed aside. Now, what about all the other laws that nationally chartered banks depend upon? Think about it. Property law, contract law, tort law. The, state Supreme, the federal Supreme Court says that's fine. That's not specifically directed to banking. Now, where did they come up with this distinction? Basically, the way that they were thinking is that nationally chartered banks are only federal agencies for the purposes of banking business. And so to the extent that the states regulate banking business specifically, have a state law that targets banking business, they're sort of like regulating a federal agency and they shouldn't do it. It doesn't matter whether the feds have actually regulated that particular kind of banking business. Even if there's a black hole where nobody's regulated it, the state should be pushed aside. This was a theory of the Waite and Fuller courts, Republican-dominated courts. And I think it was largely dominant until the early 20th century. And if you ask me what ousted it, and this is you know, the final part of my second point, what caused a hostile reaction to it, it was almost certainly the Panic of 1907. Because during the Panic of 1907, J.P. Morgan essentially managed to contain the damage from his private library. And that was a good thing, but the bad thing was some private guy accountable to no one was essentially running our banking system. And so a groundswell of progressive and populist anger towards the phrase he uses, the House of Morgan, led to the election of Woodrow Wilson and his key aide, Louis Brandeis. And Louis Brandeis, in his famous pamphlet, Other People's Money, in 1912, um, backed up by the Peugeot Commission, um, lashed out against the idea that private bankers should ever be immune from public regulation. He essentially said, you cannot have bankers be self-regulated. So if there's a banking risk, have someone regulate it. If not the states, then the feds. But don't have a case where the feds give a blank check, banking pun intended, to a private corporation. And this leads to my third and final point. Has the federal instrumentality theory been repudiated by the Supreme Court and then revived by the OCC? Yes, on both counts. Between 1922, roughly, and 1945, the U.S. Supreme Court thoroughly washed its hands of the federal instrumentality theory. Now, why did they do it? We all know why they did it. In an Atherton versus FDIC in 1995 decision, I think it was Justice Breyer, um, but what? Yes. yeah, good, my memory's still, um, basically explained why the federal instrumentality theory now made zero sense. It makes no sense because everybody knows that national banks are no longer federal agencies. Nicholas Biddle of the Second Bank of the United States can make a plausible claim that he was sort of like the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. After all, he was the exclusive federal agent. He had federal directors sitting on his board, appointed by the President of the United States. But the notion that Jamie Dimon or some that nationally chartered bank, and there's thousands of them out there, are like little FBI agents or little HUD field offices or little post offices running around with a federal license to regulate themselves is absurd. Everyone realizes this. The US Supreme Court realizes it. Um, and they have said it several times, all of us understand that these are private corporations essentially engaged in self-interested, perfectly acceptable self-interested behavior. Now that doesn't mean that they're bad. It simply means that we can't assume that because they say a banking risk should not be regulated, therefore a genuinely public official has passed on that risk. But that's exactly what the OCC is trying to say today. If you look at their 04 and 11 rules, you cannot explain them in terms of market harmonization. You cannot explain them in terms of the needs for uniformity. And the reason is simple. They're not geared towards regulating interstate banking. They say no state can pass a banking-specific regulation, even if that banking-specific regulation is regulating the most podunk nationally chartered bank that doesn't send a single letter outside the boundaries of the states. So they wiped off the slate a whole bunch of state banking rules for nationally chartered banks, even though they do nothing to harmonize banking because the rules are being wiped out for state banks that don't, or for nationally chartered banks that don't engage in interstate banking. National charter is not a good proxy for interstate. If I make one point clear, I would make that point clear. A national charter is just a piece of paper saying you're subject to OCC control.
but it has nothing whatsoever to do with interstate harmonization. Anybody who tells you different, I think, is misleading you. There are lots of genuine, dark, large interstate banks that need nationally uniform regulation. But the OCC rules are utterly blind to the distinction between interstate banking and intrastate banking. What did the OCC rules do? They essentially are Xerox copies of OTSs, the Office of Thrift Supervision Rules. They draw a distinction between general laws, common law of tort, property, contract, general criminal law, and banking-specific rules. That's the only thing they do. Why have we seen that distinction before? Why we've seen it in the 19th century jurisprudence between roughly 1864 and 1922, a jurisprudence that's been totally repudiated by the Supreme Court. It's essentially the federal instrumentality theory and drag. What's the drag? The drag is, oh, we're engaged in market harmonization. Forget that idea. There's nothing in these rules that even has anything roughly to do with focusing on the problem of interstate banking. And so I would say that if you want to understand the genesis of OCC preemption, you have to understand that in the guise of trying to address a modern banking industry, they're essentially trying to revive Alexander Hamilton's and John Marshall's theory that certain kinds of private leaders can be trusted to regulate themselves. And you see this sometimes in their short, their concise general statement and justification of their rules. I think that theory has been repudiated, but whether you believe that it has been repudiated by both Congress, the courts, and the president, and Art will speak to that, I want you to understand that that is effective theory they're pushing, not some theory that harmonization of interstate banking is needed. Thanks a lot. Thank you, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you again. I think uh, I also was with uh, the symposium a couple years ago. I'm, I'm pleased to say that I think we've made a little progress since then, but uh, not without a lot of uh, rear guard fighting and new threats. Uh, so I agree with everything that Rick said. I think the, the federal instrumentality theory, you know, you, you could make some arguments for it uh, with the first and second banks. They were uh, federal agents, federal depositaries. They collected all the customs, among other things. They had these quasi-central banking powers, although I also agree with Rick. Uh, they were really not under federal control, uh, and I can see, uh, obviously, why Jackson honed in on that. Uh, the, the, the national banks that were created in the Civil War actually had two functions that, that, that made them arguably federal agents until 1913. One is that they... Uh, basically issued the exclusive national currency in the, in the form of national bank notes. And secondly, uh, they were required to, to purchase U.S. bonds to back up those notes. I mean, basically part of the, 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 the there are two functions of the National Bank Act. One was to create a national currency, which was badly needed. The second was to create a, basically an outlet for sale of government bonds to fund the war. And, and national banks did both those things. So you could argue, okay, they were not like the Bank of the United States. They were small local banks. They were actually one, one branch, one office banks. Uh, but, but they did have these two functions that were connected to the federal financing efforts. But that disappeared. I mean, in, in 1913, the Fed took those functions over. Uh, yes, I think there was sort of a transitional period where, the, where they could issue national bank notes until the early 30s, but basically they, it wasn't important. But after that, they were purely private corporations in exactly the way that, that, that Rick ex, uh, has described. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were simply private business corporations uh, and in Osborne versus Bank of the United States, uh, the second uh, big preemption decision regarding the second Bank of the United States, Marshall was pretty much forced to acknowledge, kind of in retreat uh, from, from McCullough, that, look, if, if, if we were only talking about a private business corporation carrying on the private business of banking, he said the federal charter would not matter. They would be subject to state law in the same way as any other uh, business corporation. Uh, it, it's because they're federal instrumentalities and federal agents that they get preemptive, that the second bank got preemptive immunity. Of course, uh, the OCC conveniently never cites Osborne, never cites this admission, never acknowledges it. Uh, and unfortunately, the Supreme Court, as Rick has said, in the 19th century, never acknowledged it either. Uh, and certainly in the 20th century, when, when, when the, uh, and more recently, when the Supreme Court has, without calling it federal instrumentality theory, has quoted some of these old cases, it doesn't recognize uh, the Osborne distinction. Uh, so the worst, uh, sort of the high water mark of, of, of the OCC preemption uh, after 2004 was the Waters case, Waters versus Wachovia Bank, decided in 2008, which is filled with echoes and quotes from these cases uh, from the 19th and early 20th century, sort of the second heyday of federal instrumentality that Rick talks about. Uh, and it's still a bad decision. Uh, it has echoes today. 
look at the Parks versus M MBNA case out of the California Supreme Court last year, uh, where basically, a, a complete surprise to me, uh, the California Supreme Court basically downloaded large portions of the uh, OCCs and national bank briefs, which are filled with the same you know, Waters rhetoric. Uh, the state AGs need to attack Waters head on every time you get the chance. I mean, Waters effectively was overruled by Dodd-Frank. I mean, Dodd-Frank says that, that, that op subs, uh, subsidiaries, affiliates, and agents of national banks get no preemptive immunity. Uh, that overrules the central holding of, of Waters. Um, unfortunately, they didn't, you know, they didn't come out and say that's what they were doing, but that's what they were doing. Secondly, uh, Cuomo effectively limited Waters to just that holding. So Cuomo came a year later. Uh, I wrote an article about Cuomo, and I said the difference between Cuomo and Waters is the subprime financial crisis occurred in between. At the time of Waters, you know, basically the OCC told uh, uh, the Supreme Court, look, uh, get the states out of our hair, stop them from passing these predatory lending laws. We're in control of things. Everything is fine. We're in control. We've got, we've, we've got it under, un, under uh, regulation ourselves. And by a 5-3 decision, the, the Supreme Court said, okay. Uh, well, by a year later, uh, the Supreme Court realized the OCC did not have it under control. That, in fact, Wachovia Bank, which was the plaintiff in, in, in the Waters case, had gone under by then because of a lot of bad loans that they had made to subprime and option arm borrowers. Uh, so the Supreme Court realized that they could no longer trust the OCC. And, you know, essentially three justices on the Supreme Court flipped their votes from Waters to Cuomo. And in Cuomo, both in the oral argument, Justice Ginsburg, who wrote the Waters opinion, uh, and then in the opinion itself, the Supreme Court goes out, goes to, out of its way to say, Waters decided that, that subsidiaries of national banks get the same preemption as the national banks themselves. Waters decides no other question. Okay, well, since that holding was overruled by Dodd-Frank, Title 10, then Waters stands for nothing. But every case that comes up, the national banks and the OCC will trot out Waters and all that bad rhetoric again and again and again. And the state AGs have to fight that. Uh, uh, Rick points out uh, Atherton is a very important case. Uh, so is O'Melveny and Myers. Okay, these cases were decided about the same time in the mid-90s. Uh, one is by Breyer, one is by Scalia. Of course, it's important because Breyer wrote the Barnett case too. And they're basically saying, you know, federal law does not fill in the gaps. You know, Congress speaks, and, and, and when, when, when the statute is silent, state law fills in the gaps. You know, because in each case they denied the impact of federal common law. They said, you know, the FDIC and, and, and uh, can't go around making up, you know, federal common law on, on things like liability of, of bank directors and bank uh, advisors because either Congress speaks or state law fills in the gaps. Um, so I think that state AGs used in, you need to use Barnett, Atherton, O'Malveny, uh, 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 and, and Cuomo, and you know, and, and use those cases plus Dodd-Frank to say Waters should no longer be given any credence. I mean, I think uh, Rick's work is very important. Waters is based upon a now discredited theory. Uh, it should be laid to rest. But, it, but you'll find it quoted in every preemption case uh, on the OCC National Bank side. So what has the OCC not done, right, that, that, that Dodd-Frank said they must do? Okay, so OCC did some things. They, they, they basically rescinded their subsidiary rule, which had said, uh, basically made out of whole cloth, subsidiaries get the same preemption as national banks. I mean, that was, there was no, no basis for that whatsoever. There was no history. They just made it up. Uh, Rick is absolutely right. They used the OTS playbook. Guess who created the OTS playbook? Julie Williams. She was chief counsel of the OTS. Arguably, I'm not convinced, but arguably the OTS is a broader statute, doesn't have as many protections for state law. So, uh, that, that you got quasi field preemption under under OTS theory. She brought that quasi field preemption over to the national banks uh, when she came to the OCC in the mid '90s. Again, never quite dared call it that, but but in everything but name, it was quasi field preemption. Um, so, uh, but basically, Dodd Frank sticks a nail in that in that coffin and says, no, no, no. There's no field preemption now under the National Bank Act. It's conflict preemption only which also blows the federal instrumentality theory out because you can't have real conflict preemption if you're treating national banks as federal instrumentalities. Uh, and fortunately, it also says under the Homeowners Loan Act for, for 
the remaining federal thrifts, which are now under OCC supervision because the OTS was put in its justifiable grave, uh, you know, I, along with Sheila Beer, think the OCC might have suffered the same fate, but uh, that, that didn't happen. Uh, you know, the, the HOLA is now under the same conflict preemption standards. The preemption standards for the, OT, for the federal thrifts under HOLA are exactly the same as for national banks under the National Bank Act. And the OCC admitted it. Okay, so they say, okay, yes, it's conflict preemption. They also rescinded their op sub, uh, subsidiary rules uh, for both uh, federal thrifts and national banks. They also did away with a, a self-invented, fanciful preemption standard called obstruct, impair, or condition, which you couldn't find in any case. They basically spliced words out of about five different cases and said, well, you know, we think that the best distillation of Supreme Court jurisprudence is obstruct, impair, or condition, even though you can't find the, that, that formulation in any Supreme Court case, even the ones they like to cite. Uh, they, they admitted they had to do away with that. Okay, so they admitted they had to make changes, but they refused to adopt the prevent or significantly interfere standard, which appears in Barnett, and which the Supreme Court expressly codified, saying this is the legal preemption standard under Barnett, preempt or significantly interfere. Uh, unfortunately, the Parks case pays no attention to it and basically says significant means nothing, anything that's inconvenient, which is ridiculous. Um, the OCC refuses to put that in this rule. Instead, it says, well, that's just the starting point, they say. Uh, for preemption analysis. So we adopt a broad conflict preemption analysis under Barnett, and then they try to use uh, much broader language uh, that arguably appears in Barnett, which is, in my view, misconstrued out of context, but they, they don't accept the congressional standard. They also maintained all their blanket categorical preemption rules, as Rick said, basically saying anything with regard to deposits is out. Anything with regard to real estate lending, out. Anything with regard to other lending, out. Any state law that specifically affects those areas is out. And, and, and I mean, this is bizarre. Dodd-Frank says you have to have substantial evidence for every preemptive standard you adopt if you're the OCC, and you must adopt, you must act on a case-by-case -case basis. And basically, if you try to say that the, the state laws of more than one state are preempted, you have to show why, you know, why the laws are similar, and you have to consult with the CFPB and basically say, do you agree with me, right? Do you agree with me, the OCC, that uh, these categories of state laws are preempted? Uh, well, they basically reaffirmed all their rules. They didn't consult with the CFPB. They didn't give anybody the chance for more notice and comment. Uh, and they didn't provide any substantial evidence. In fact, the original 2004 rules basically said, we are not acting specifically. We are, we are acting generically. Uh, and we are not relying on you know, specific evidence of conflict here or conflict there. These categories of state laws are just bad per se. Uh, now, how can that stand up under a substantial evidence and case-by-case -case standard? Not only that, but Dodd-Frank said two more things. They said under Section 1043, okay, OCC rules and OTS rules also are good for transactions before July 21, 2010. So as to, as to the transactions that occurred before Dodd-Frank, you can still apply the old Dodd-Frank, I mean, the old OTS and OCC preemption rules. Well, why would Congress say that if they meant that the OCC could keep their rules for everything else? That doesn't make any sense. Congress went one step further. They said, okay, going forward, past Dodd-Frank, the existing OCC preemption rules for usury, for interest rate preemption, are still good. Well, again, why would Congress say that if they meant every other OCC rule is okay? But the OCC, I mean, the OCC was told this over and over. Even the Treasury Department, this is relevant to the last panel, the Treasury Department General Counsel came out and said, you are wrong. These rules are bad. And by the way, you know, we're kind of your, not really your boss, but we're at least your senior advisor. And the OCC said, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. He's just a general counsel of the Treasury Department, right? We don't pay, we don't, we don't answer to him. And so they just, they did, they just put in the same rules anyway. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a truly astonishing performance, uh, but not unprecedented. The OCC has been doing this throughout its history. The OCC has always plucked out the rules it liked and disregarded the rules it didn't like. 
If you go back to a famous 1966 case, a branching case called First National Bank of Logan versus Walker Bank and Trust Company, the OCC willfully disregarded and, and, and misconstrued uh, the, the rules for branching. And the Supreme Court was so provoked, in a unanimous opinion, the Supreme Court says, it is a strange uh, approach that allows someone to pick and choose the law that binds him. Now, is that a rebuke or is that a rebuke? I mean, they're basically saying to the OCC, you are willfully misconstruing the statute. You're only following the part you like. You are disregarding the part you don't like. You would have thought the OCC would be kind of abashed and kind of embarrassed. They never changed. They're still doing the same thing today. I mean, this is a rogue agency. I'm sorry, it's a rogue agency. It does not believe that it has to follow the law. I was at a, an interesting conference about 10, uh, 15 years ago, and a senior representative of the Fed was there, and a senior recent, uh, recently employed senior representative of the OCC was there, and, and they were arguing about preemption in interstate banking. And, and uh, the, the, the Fed representative, to my astonishment, turned to the OCC guy and said, you know, the difference with the Fed is we actually think we have to follow the law. And the place broke up laughing. Uh, and it was like, it was like the J Chief Justice Rehnquist's question at the oral argument uh, in Smiley versus Citibank, where he says, gee, I've noticed during my time in the Supreme Court that the OCC keeps coming in and supporting the national banks. Has, he ever see, has the OCC ever not supported the national banks? Have they ever done anything that the national banks didn't like? Have they ever actually come into a case and opposed them? And, you know, the Solicitor General fumbled and mumbled, but no, he couldn't come up with any example in which the OCC ever said no uh, to the national banks. He sort of said, well, we didn't give them all they wanted. They gave them most of what they wanted. Uh, my final point is to look at, th I, I urge you to read the J.P. Morgan London Wheel investigative report issued about a month ago uh, by Senator Levin's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. It is a devastating, devastating report because what it shows is after the financial crisis, after the financial crisis, the OCC basically turned a blind eye, paid no attention to what J.P. Morgan was doing with literally $300 billion worth of deposits inside the, 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 the chief investment office that was making you know, reckless, rampant speculation in, in credit derivatives with this money and losing and then trying to hide it, trying to cover it up. So that J.P. Morgan repeatedly did not give the OCC the, the information it should have. When, when the OCC asked them for information, J.P. Morgan pushed them back and said, stop being intrusive, you know, go away, you're bothering us. You, know, you, know, you have no right for this information. Finally, when it, when it exploded, um, the OCC began to react a little bit. But Tom Curry, who is the new OCC uh, controller of the currency, came in. This greeted him three days after he took office. He went to his senior uh, uh, bank supervision person, and he went to Julie Williams, and he said, what goes here? And the senior bank supervision guy said, well, there's a loss here, but it's not really material, and it's okay. Uh, this is after they found out that it wasn't okay. I mean, billions of dollars had been lost by that time. And Julie Williams said, well, from our first look, it looks like they're just hedging, and it's okay under the Volcker rule. Well, it wasn't hedging, and it's not okay under the Volcker rule. That's made abundantly clear by the report. So it's like, this is an agency that likes to push around the states, right? They push around the states big time. This is an agency that doesn't like to pay attention to what the Congress or the courts tell them. But when it comes to their own constituents, when they're really big guys, they get pushed around. And this gets back to Rick's point. Who's in control here? Is the House of Morgan in control? Is Congress in control? Is the OCC in control? The banks are in control. Because, you know, it, even to this date, they've issued a cease and desist order. Have they issued a financial penalty? No. Have they issued, taken any action against any of the executives or traders? Not yet. Uh, we just heard from the Attorney General Holder that these banks are too big to jail, too big to prosecute. Uh, I mean, I think, I think Rick's history lesson is, is abundantly important because actually if you read uh, Louis Brandeis's Other People's Money in 1914, you would actually think you're reading the, today's newspaper. Uh, are the banks in control or are we in control? And what are the new, I, I think the first and second banks in the United States were classic GSEs like Fannie and Freddie, you know, public, you know privatizing gain and, 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 public, and, and pushing the loss off on the public, the risk. And I think the big national banks, the big four or six, are our new GSEs. We better get them under control. And 
um, this is a big problem. Uh, so Dodd-Frank is helpful, but it's not the end of the story. The state AGs have to have to fight very hard to, to maintain what you gained under Dodd-Frank and not let it be lost, because there are lots of people who want to take it away from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, what I wanted to do is um, try to just um, use, as I said, this uh, uh, example of OCC uh, preemption and maybe expand upon it a little bit, and then I will uh, be brief so that we make sure we get questions um, from our from our audience. So um, Tom Pirelli alluded to the fact that in May 2009, uh, President Obama um, issued a presidential memorandum on preemption. And what that uh, memorandum did, it went out to uh, all of the uh, executive branch uh, agencies and asked them to do a kind of 10-year retrospective to look back in time, to look at their uh, preemptive regulations in particular to make sure that they were uh, justified. There's, um, they wanted to make sure that they were consistent with uh, the Federalism Executive Order 13132. And in the description of our panel, there's some uh, language quoted there that preemption of state law by executive departments and agencies should be undertaken only with full consideration of the legitimate prerogatives of the states and with a sufficient legal basis uh, for preemption. And at the time um, I served, I was asked uh, by the uh, new chairman of the Administrative Conference of the United States, which um, had existed in the past and then was defunded. So this was uh, Paul Verkeil was coming back uh, and uh, reigniting this uh, institution, ACUS, uh, and he asked me to serve as an um, academic consultant. It was kind of exciting because it was their first project. He wanted to do a project on uh, uh, agency procedures for considering preemption of state law. So I signed on to that project, and what was exciting to me was that I got to design uh, which agencies I wanted to look at and look at um, how they were responding in particular to this preemption uh, memorandum and more generally how uh, seriously they took the federalism executive order. Uh, and this uh, project um, identified the agencies that I chose weren't random. I uh, picked some agencies I, that I knew something about and something about their uh, recent activity uh, in, in um, issuing preemptive regulations. So the FDA, the Food Drug Administration, NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, were key on my list, particularly because I, as I mentioned before, I'm a professor, I study products liability as well as administrative law. So those agencies uh, were key. I also included the Consumer Product Safety Commission, smaller agency, but one focused on uh, products, an independent agency. Um, and I also uh, chose the OCC, because while I was uh, certainly a neophyte, I remain a neophyte, uh, as uh, Professor Wilmarth uh, already has been extremely generous over, over the years because I'm a neophyte in his area with kind of abstract conceptual ideas of what should go on. And he's, uh, he's in for, his writing in particular has informed me uh, very much in terms of thinking about this as one application. But the OCC, I at least was aware of their uh, aggressiveness on the preemption uh, front. So I included them in the study as well as EPA. EPA seemed to have a lot more um, kind of cooperative federal more involvement, engagement with the states, particularly there's some differences that you all will be familiar with. The states are really co-regulators in that field, much more so than, say, uh, in the realm of uh, drugs and medical devices for the FDA. I also um, included OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. That's the um, uh, branch of OMB that um, uh, was alluded to earlier, uh, I guess partly prompted by my question about OCC being transformed from a, an executive branch into an independent agency. They sort of play this role of uh, not only reviewing significant regulations, but they're supposedly engaged in a lot of coordination across agencies. So I thought that this issue, uh, federalism, the federalism executive order, for example, is supposed to be something that they uh, are making sure uh, is being followed by the various agencies. So one of the things I was interested in looking at is just how much uh, in practice do the agencies pay attention to this. Um, and I want to make two points, uh, and then again, uh, maybe we can get into some broader discussion of some of these about what this uh, experience showed me, and also um, looking specifically at Dodd-Frank and the OCC as a kind of exemplar of um, some of the uh, theories or recommendations that came out of this project. So the first is um, uh, one of the uh, 
uh, points that I tried to make in both the uh, report to ACUS, and ACUS actually adopted uh, recommendations that um, that were put forward, um, and then I wrote a longer law review article so I could independently say my own views of how these recommendations really should play out, called Inside Agency Preemption, if anyone's uh, interested in it. But one of the main thrusts of the recommendation was that all agencies, and again, here I think Dodd-Frank actually becomes an interesting exemplar of, a, of Congress forcing a particular agencies to do this, but that all of these agencies should be engaged uh, in, um, in conflict preemption, not field preemption. And there were ways in which um, uh, uh, the FDA was likewise trying to exert broader uh, authority in the way that uh, Art was mentioning earlier about uh, OCC without explicitly saying it. Uh, we're trying to preempt broad fields as opposed to on a case-by-case -case basis. So Dodd-Frank certainly reigns in the OCC in that respect by saying that this has to be case-by-case. Uh, -case. I think importantly what it does with its substantial evidence standard that it was alluded to and something that I pushed in the, OC, in the ACUS recommendations across the board for all agencies is that when you're looking at conflict preemption, the idea is you're supposed to show that there is uh, an actual conflict, right? I mean, Art uh, read this uh, standard uh, from Barnett about prevent or significantly interfere. Uh, likewise, the FDA, NHTSA, et cetera, are supposed to, when they are uh, issuing preemptive regulations, think about whether or not the state, and here we're talking about state common law as well as state regulations that get preempted, uh, whether or not there's something that uh, serves as an obstacle to the federal regulatory scheme. And the idea that there should be a substantial evidence standard, I think, is very important. And one thing that uh, the ACUS recommendations pushed was how there should be this underlying factual or empirical substrate that has to be demonstrated by the agency in the agency record to show that there should be preemption. It shouldn't just be an ideological preference or the idea that they're not going to, um, that they're going to do something better uh, than the states will or that the common law uh, of torts will do. So I think that's very important. Also, uh, Dodd-Frank uh, specifically uh, said, although I say, they, they said that the standard is no longer going to be Chevron or mandatory deference to the OCC. It's going to be the Skidmore or power to persuade standard. And I think that's really key. That was an issue that... Um, uh, comes up outside of the boundaries of OCC preemption. So for example, the FDA uh, prior uh, to uh, the US Supreme Court's reigning in, I would argue, its, uh, its um, authority under the Wyeth versus Levine case, the FDA tried in a uh, preemptive preamble to one of its drug labeling and uh, the, uh, a, a regulation about the content of drug labeling said in its preamble to a regulation that this should preempt state common law. And it did that, you know, the preamble didn't go through notice and comment. Not only did it not go through notice and comment, but it, uh, the FDA in the notice of proposed rulemaking had a preamble that said this will not preempt. <laughs> Then the rule went out for notice and comment, and then the final rule came back where that position had changed, you know, 180 degrees. So that got the Supreme Court's attention in the Wyeth versus Levine case. I think it was a major reason why the court decided not to give deference to the FDA uh, on its uh, preemption. But prior to Wyeth versus Levine, if you looked at what was happening across the country, the FDA was intervening in lawsuits asking for Chevron deference to its position and getting it from the courts. And so this issue about the level of deference being given to the agency, as well as what kind of factual or empirical showing they have to show before they can issue preemptive regulations, I think is a bigger picture issue. And I think Dodd-Frank, uh, moved in, a, in the correct direction, and I think the recommendations in the ACUS report are consistent with that. The second point that I want to make has to do with, again, Tom Pirelli raised this issue about accountability, what I'd call, you know, I think sort of federalism accountability. And I think that too often um, uh, we think not only that uh, Congress 
is the right institution, but we think that they appropriately are going to be thinking about the balance between federal and state interests. And many groups that represent state interests, including uh, many that are gathered here, I think historically have had their sights set on Congress and about trying to influence Congress. And I think Tom asked a really important question when he said many of his private clients, but I think many of the state-based uh, groups are asking this question too, where do we go? Where do we go both to unite our efforts and also to be heard? And one answer to that I think has to be, you can't only go to Congress. In this day and age in the modern administrative regulatory state, you have to have your eyes on the federal regulatory process. And I think that sometimes, right, it's a two-way street, sometimes these and I know because as part of the ACUS project, I sat down with the Big Seven. I was working with a lot of the other groups, many of whom are in this room. And, and their key questions uh, about who represents the appropriate state interests, et cetera, uh, one of the uh, suggestions that I made that got adopted in a slightly watered down version in the ACUS report is I suggested there should be an uh, AG notification provision when there is preemptive uh, rulemaking, because oftentimes the state AGs might be in the best position to actually locate the right state agency, the right base, the right state-based interests who might want to get engaged in the process. But more broadly, as part of the longer law review article, I urge those group re representing states that they shouldn't opt out of the federal regulatory process. So you shouldn't opt out of the notice and comment of the um, federalism executive order mandates just because there'd been a kind of bad history. I understand. I heard stories, for example, from groups from the Big Seven about how they would uh, be getting their notice from the FDA or NHTSA, let's say, about preemptive rulemaking. It would be sent to someone who was, you know, deceased by more than four decades. It would be going to the person <laughs> in their entity. So there were there was some low hanging fruit. The ACUS report actually uh, recommended various things about getting lists of whom should be consulted in these various groups, et cetera. But there's obviously a bigger kind of systemic issue about who's open for these kinds of discussions. But I really do think that um, there should be uh, a lot of focus needs to be placed on the fact that, like it or not, a lot of this action is going to be moving uh, from Congress over to the federal agencies and that the state-based interests need to be engaging uh, in that process. Knowing that um, our time is relatively short and we stand between you and lunch, uh, I want to make sure we give time for people to ask questions. So we have about 15 minutes left, and I think I want to open up the floor. That's okay. The sure, absolutely. Stand. Thanks. I'm, I'm Mike Houghton from Delaware. I, I have a question. Uh, Keen, Catherine, off, off your, your last point. Um, it's not a criticism. I just think it's a reality. I mean, it's great to say... The focus really has to be on on federal administrative agencies and organizations weighing in <clears throat> and participating. I have a feeling, though, that there is a, a lack of resources, a lack of energy, and a view that there's going to be a lack of return. Because part of what you've noted is the perceived, perhaps incorrect, disinterest or lack of responsiveness on the part of federal re regulators in various areas. So I think just as business tends to gravitate towards Congress as the quicker solution uh, and, and as a silver bullet to deal with the issue, I have a feeling, and I'm prepared to be proven wrong by anybody in the room who represents state agencies, that uh, there may be that same gravitational pull on the part of state agencies to go to your senator, to go to your congressman and say, look, we can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars that we don't have in our administrative budget drafting comments that will be ignored, or we can come to you, Senator, or we can come to you, Congressman, to try to get it fixed. I think that's probably part of the dynamic, and I wondered if you had any comment on that. You know, I, I, would, I fought this preemption battle against the OCC, you know, 20 years at least, maybe maybe longer. Maybe, you, know, you, you could look at it as 30 years or 20 years, but I, I, I fought it a long time. Uh, what I've seen is that, you know, uh, Congress is great if you can get the solution, but, you know, the Dodd-Frank bill came out of an enormous crisis. Actually, I think Title 10 is astonishingly good. Uh, the, the denial of Chevron preemption is hugely important. Um, but it took an enormous crisis to get Dodd-Frank. Um, th and, and there are many other points of Dodd-Frank that I'm not nearly as fond of. I don't think they're nearly strong enough, particularly the too big to fail provisions. But um, it, you know, it's so hard to get that done. Uh, and we had tried 
in different ways to get similar language, you know, going back 20 years before. So I think Congress is very important, but your ability to move Congress, particularly where you know, you're, you're attacking or are perceived as attacking uh, major private groups, the banks, tremendously powerful, big pharma, tremendously powerful. Uh, I presume the same would be true with energy and, and, and uh, uh, related, environmental related. So it's hard to move Congress, and the, the, the money against you is huge. So Congress is important, but I think the reason why I think the agency process is important is not because you're going to win. Unfortunately, if you have an FDA or an OCC that's determined to preempt, you're not going to stop them. But you're going to create a record, and that record w will allow you to go to court. Um, and you know, it took us a long time to get to Cuomo. We, we had a lot of disappointments and a lot of reverses. But the fact that we had made that record and the fact that, that I think Cuomo, the, the court in Cuomo looked at the states and said, you've been telling us this is going to happen if you don't stop preemption. You've been telling us this. You told us again in waters and we didn't listen to you and then everything blew up. You know what? We're listening to you this time. We're going to give the states the ability to, to, to enforce these laws through judicial enforcement. But I think we would not have succeeded in Cuomo. And I think without Cuomo, we would not have succeeded uh, getting what we got in, in Dodd-Frank. Uh, they, they codified Cuomo as well as Barnett. We wouldn't have succeeded unless we had created a record where the, the, the rulemaking shows that the states kept saying, don't do this. You're going to, you're going to create disaster uh, if you take these laws and our ability to enforce them away from us. And, and so the OCC kept disregarding, disregarding, disregarding. And then finally, uh, you know, the world blew up and the fingerprints were there. Now, I agree with you. Resources are a problem. So this makes organizations like MAG uh, and the National uh, Governors Association, the National Conference of State Legislatures, hugely important. I think you sort of have to do a tag team, right? MAG can't be expected to do every comment, every, you know, especially because they're going to do more of the cases. NAG and, and NCSL are going to have to help out. Uh, last thing I would say is, unfortunately, NAG has to keep track of these cases. For some reason, Parks, I never heard of the case until it came out. Uh, I, don't, I don't follow it as close as I should. But that's a case where the states were not heard sufficiently. I cannot believe that the court would have issued that opinion as bad as it was if there had been good briefing on the other side. There wasn't. Uh, so unfortunately, NAG needs to play bird dog on these big cases coming up. Um, and, and so unfortunately, I hear you, the resources are tough, but in a way it's agency, courts, Congress, you need a multi-prong uh, strategy where at least some part of the state system is, is, is engaging and creating a record. So when things go badly, like, like these compounding pharmacies maybe, I don't know what, what extent preemption was involved there, you can say, look, we told you, right? We told you this would happen. And you didn't listen. Now the courts, hopefully, if not Congress, will do something. Yeah, I'll just say very briefly because I put, put I think the things I might have wanted to say more elegantly than than I would. But I do think so. There's a key. I think the judicial uh, review of these kinds of processes is starting to change. Uh, Dodd Frank is unique in that it speaks to the standard of judicial review and speaks to this substantial evidence. It really is. I do commend the Parks decision. We've talked about it as panelists before from the California State Supreme Court. It's kind of, um, it's really eyebrow raising because it's unanimous decision from a state Supreme Court that tends to be in other areas very consumer protection oriented. And it not only just kind of downloads the briefs from the American Banking Association, it specifically says that if they were to ask for specific evidence of significant interference, that that would be sort of an overwhelming factual burden that could never be met. And that's the standard in Don Frank. So you want to say, well, I don't. I think you were wrong then. But the fact that no one seemed to have been pressing really strongly the need for that and putting before the court any evidence of that, I think, is a is a great example of what can happen if there isn't this engaged uh, presence. So I do think uh, I just want to echo what Art uh, said with respect to uh, to the extent courts are going to start looking more closely at the regulatory record. And I think they are, certainly they are in, in the Dodd-Frank context, but I think in uh, more subtle ways they are uh, just in general. The whole preemption debate has really significantly shifted in the US Supreme Court between 
uh, looking primarily just at Congress and statutory interpretation, which still is key in these cases, but looking at what's happening by the agency. So for example, in Wyeth versus Levine, not giving deference to the FDA because of this fast and loose moving in the administrative process. And so the extent to which interventions by state-based interest in the notice and comment, particularly stuff that brings empirical evidence as to how something would not be a significant interference or what the negative consequences of preemption would be, I think could be critical. Uh, um, that's, my, that's my view. Just a, a very quick um, suggestion. You guys need to form a federal administrative law firm. The National State and Local Law Center files amicus briefs in Supreme Court cases, and they have really improved the briefing of your guys' interests in the Supreme Court. Their amicus briefs are first rate. But there is no analogous law firm in Washington, D.C. that represents state and local governments in administrative process. And it wouldn't cost that much to set up such a law firm. There's 50 states. If you each pony up 100,000 bucks, Okay, 50, do I hear 50? <laughs> yeah, you could get a comment filed in every single major rulemaking that would be empirical, data-based, and really put the agencies on their guard. Um, and that's the thing you have to understand, that if you put that into the kitty, that's the basis for the federal courts to kill the agency later, because they have to respond to that comment under State Farm. And that's what you're trying to do, make the administrative record. But if you go in there as, even as that big seven, you're always going to duplicate each other's rec efforts, and more importantly, you want the specialization of doing the whole administrative process. So why not set up a law firm? Uh, I tell you, you, you got one in the Supreme Court, that's too late. Other, other questions? I, I would just say, it, 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 not to preempt other questions, uh, <laughs> confuse upon, uh, but one of the big questions left open by Dodd-Frank, which I think is hugely important, Rick has pointed out the difference between specifically applicable state laws that deal directly with banking activities versus state laws of general application. Actually, Dodd-Frank Title 10 only speaks about the specific laws because if you look at the definition of, of consumer financial laws, they are laws that specifically and directly relate to transactions between banks and a consumer. So the, the, actually, Title 10 of Dodd-Frank, in my view, does not speak as to what happens to state contract laws, state tort laws, state real property transfer laws, things like that, state debt collection laws. Um, and so it's open for grabs as to what standard is going to apply there. Now, the OCC has pretty much indicated they think the Barnett standard should apply there, too. I don't agree with that, because I, I would go back to the Atherton and Melvany and Myers approach and say, Congress has only spoken with regard to specifically applicable state laws that directly relate to uh, consumer banking transactions or consumer financial transactions. So Congress has left open the question of what happens to generally applicable state laws. In my view, the argument that, this, that every state should make is it's a presumption against preemption. It's the Wyeth versus Levine approach. And, and if you look at Cuomo, you read my article on Cuomo, basically the court did not reject that. I mean, the court basically said we don't need to go. We don't need to go to the presumption against preemption because even without the presumption, the, the OCC's position is, is absurd in the majority's view, okay? So they didn't, they did, said, so we don't need to go there. But they cited Wyeth versus Levine with, uh, in, in a positive way. Uh, they also uh, said, basically, state laws of general applicability have always applied to national banks. Always, they say, ever since the National Bank Act was passed. Um, Unfortunately, there's, there's some bad stuff in a case called Locke, but I think in, in, in implicitly the Cuomo, as I argue, rejects Locke because the, the dissent relied on Locke and the majority said it's not applicable. Uh, and if you can get to Wyeth versus Levine, if, if we could get to a presumption against preemption of generally applicable state laws, which Wyeth upheld, that would be as, as important as the idea that we're not going to have to fight Chevron. So that's, that's an issue that states have to fight, and it's not settled. I want to thank the panelists for a really fascinating presentation. Uh, there's a lot that's happened in the last two years. My guess is if we come back, and when we do come back in two more, there will be a lot more that will have occurred. Hopefully so in I the right direction. Right? Thank, thank, <laughs> thank you all. Uh, I'd like to invite the participants now to uh, grab their lunch in the back of the room, grab a seat, and uh, we will have Senator Risch of Idaho, who will join us at about 1 o'clock. Uh, so we have about 30 minutes to, to eat. Uh, thank you all. That was great. That was great. Yeah. Yeah.